The Omicron variant is spreading around the world and is on track to become the dominant strain of the coronavirus. Here in the U.S., cases and hospitalizations are surging, prompting a new wave of canceled events. The rapid emergence of this strain also has many questioning whether they should rethink their holiday travel plans. Dr. Eric Topol, founder and director of Scripps Research Translational Institute, joins us now for analysis. Dr. Topol, thank you so much for being here. I want to jump right in because, as you know, it feels really eerily similar to March of 2020. And I just want to run through some numbers we got from New York today, reporting over 20,000 new COVID cases, which is the highest daily total of the pandemic so far. Hospitalizations also rose from 74 to 3,839 And among the triple jabbed among us, we're really wondering, can we do anything to avoid getting sick? Is it inevitable that we're all going to get this? Well, good to be with you, Madison. Uh, It is not inevitable. We don't have to have a mea culpa to the Omicron virus. We know all the things that work. We knew that back in early 2020, and we know it uh, here as we move on to 2022. Uh, It's a respiratory virus and masks and distancing and ventilation and air filtration, all these things are great. And uh, the better the mask, the better protection there. But also uh, we have vaccines, we have uh, boosters, which are essential. And we also have a forthcoming a pill that's gonna be highly effective, nearly 90% reduction of hospitalizations and deaths. So, you know, we, it, it, there's no reason to despair. We just have to really work to ante up to the Omicron virus. So if you've done everything right, if you're boosted and you're you know, fully inoculated, should you still plan to go home for the holidays if you have those trips planned or should people rethink their holidays? Well, that's an individual choice. But I mean, I think it, it, the best thing, of course, would be to stay put because the risk would be uh, almost zero if you really weren't out there uh, traveling and uh, mingling with other people. However, Uh, Obviously, that's not practical, and uh, we want to move on in our lives as much as we can. So there's a risk, but I already reviewed the the mitigating factors of that risk. The one thing that is disappointing, Madison, is the rapid test. We don't have them freely available, widely available throughout the country. If we had that, then we could tell who's infectious uh, and when and provide that really precise guidance. That would make Mm -hmm. a huge difference. Well, I I want to ask you... I want to ask you about those rapid tests, because one thing that's concerned me is that people are taking at-home rapids and potentially testing positive, and that's not getting counted as part of our national total of cases. Do you feel like that's accurate? Do we not have a clear picture of how bad this is because of at-home testing? Well, we haven't had a clear picture uh, since day one in the U.S., Mm. Uh, the PCRs have always been uh, constrained and a problematic. I'm not worried about people doing rapid tests on their own. That's better than nothing. Mm-hmm. And our test, our data tracking in this country has been pathetic. So no, I think the more important thing is for the, the person who's involved to have the information. And that's, by the way, Madison, that's one of the reasons why the FDA has done such a, a poor job of getting these tests approved in this country. There's more than 60 that have been approved by the European uh, medical agency. Right. And on top of that, speaking of things that the FDA has been slow to approve, we also have the uh, treatments, right? And we have uh, the, the treatments that have not gotten approved yet from the FDA, but are in existence, just waiting to, to get doled out. What do you make of the delay there? Well, the Paxlovid, uh, the, the pill, which has the high potency I mentioned, that should be imminent that the FDA should approve it. It's already gotten uh, through uh, European authorities. Uh, but the, the real issue there is that it's potent, it's safe, but we're not going to have enough of these pill blister packs for five days. We've got to go into high gear production. So here, I don't think the bottleneck is going to be regulatory. We'll have that in a matter of days. It's just going to be the supply. So when you look at kind of taking a step back here and when you look at how the U.S. has handled this pandemic as a whole, what grade would you give our federal health agencies in terms of their response to this and and why? Well, year one was was an uh, absolute F in every respect. Um, And that's why we peaked in January of this past year because of that blatant failure. Here in this second year, it's been better in terms of a very aggressive vaccine campaign. 
The problem is the virus has gotten tougher and tougher, and we've had such a poor uptake of vaccines. We still have tens of millions of people who haven't had a vaccine. We have tens of millions of people who need to get boosted, haven't shown up for that, and we have problems with distribution of boosters. Our testing has never gotten better. We've never distributed KN95 masks to every American or rapid tests for free to every American. That's the kind of stuff we should be doing. That's what other countries are doing to mount a successful, aggressive counter to the virus. So in your view, the testing is the key thing that we could change right now to mitigate the spread of Omicron? It sure would. I would add, though, better masking would be another plus. So those two together, it's never vaccines only. It's not just a vaccine centric strategy. You got to use all the tools that we have and we're not using them. Do you think that the idea that the boosters are going to save us then in that case, is that an unfounded idea? No, they're going to help, but there's no save. There's no, per they're not perfect against Omicron by any means, but they provide about a doubling of protection from not getting boosted. And we're waiting too long to give the boosters. We know that mm. by four months, there's a lot of waning. And we still in this country have a six month policy. That doesn't go along with the data. If we're gonna say we're going by the science, then go by the science and it's not being done here. So, so you think we should, right now it's like us, I think six months between boosters. Do you think yes. it should be closer to three? Well, that's what other countries are using because it takes two weeks for that booster to take its full effect you know, three or four months. I'd go with four, that's very reasonable, mm -hmm. but not six. That means we're leaving so many people out there two months dangling when they're vulnerable. Well, I wanna also talk to you about an idea that I've heard from a lot of friends when I sound a little bit freaked out about Omicron. They say, well, if you get it, you're not gonna be that sick because you're triple vaxxed. Is that accurate? Well, it is milder for sure, yeah. but it's because of the vaccines, because of the immune wall that you and others have built, but it's not predictable fully. That is, we're not ready to have chicken pox parties with Omicron, okay, because it, had, it can cause long COVID. It can be a you know, very significant illness. Mm. Uh, so if you can avoid it, that's what you want to do. That's why you want to get a booster. That's why you want to use masks and do everything we can to not get an infection because you can't predict. Most times it will likely be mild in a case where you've had triple vaccination, but you can't you know, say 100%. It's that this virus, if anything it's taught us, it's unpredictable. We never would have predicted the mutations of Omicron. Mm. Everybody thought they would evolve to some kind of Delta lineage and look what we have. So the way this is behaving, we're three weeks into it. We don't know enough about how how it's going to uh, have sequela downstream in time. So, looking three weeks ahead, what is the impact of Omicron going to be on our healthcare systems? What are you most afraid of our country's public health looking like in the weeks ahead? Well, we're going to get probably at least a million cases a day at some point. Wow, uh, we're shooting up really fast, and that's just the beginning of the Omicron surge on top of a Delta surge that we didn't get control of. So let's say it is, as I believe it will be, uh, considerably milder overall. But when you have such a big denominator of a million cases, even if it's 10% as, as uh, of the hospitalizations as Delta, that's still a big taxing of our medical resources and hospitals and, and uh, medical staff, the workforce, and a lot of sick people some of whom won't even make it. So that's the problem is a big denominator, even though there's a smaller fraction of people who get very severe disease of COVID. And how worried are you about long COVID as well for the triple vaccinated individuals who might come into contact with Omicron? Well, the vaccines will help. We have some good evidence that there's a reduction of severity and the frequency of long COVID, but I am worried about the interaction between this virus which evades our immune system and long COVID, which is at least in part uh, immune mediated. So if someone's not vaccinated and gets uh, the Omicron, there seems to be a higher risk we'll only know over time. That's what the long COVID story is all about. Yeah. Uh, with vaccination, we, we don't know that either, but there's a hope that it'll blunt the, the potential. 
All right, Dr. Tobel, I want to ask you just a couple rapid fire questions that we got in from our audience about how to make our personal life decisions, if you don't mind just being our advisor here for a moment while we have you. Really quickly, uh, if you're triple vaxxed and you test positive, how long do you have to quarantine? Well, that's a good question. Right now, you know, people are advocating 10 days, but most likely if you're vaccinated, you're going to have rapid clearance. That's what we, what we saw with Delta. We got to nail down that, those studies. But in the interim, if you have two or three days of rapid tests that are negative, that's probably a good sign you've cleared the virus. You're not infectious. But, you know, we've got to, we've got to nail that down. And that's just out there dangling right now. Of course. Well, if you're just exposed, but you don't necessarily test positive yet, should you immediately jump into quarantining, stay home from school and work? That would be advised. Get some rapid tests. And if you're not infectious after a few days, you're not having symptoms, that would be a good sign. We're going to learn more about that in the days ahead. Restaurants, yes or no? Uh, outside, okay. Inside, I wouldn't go there right what, now. What about a dining experience with your family over the holidays, a small house gathering? I have no problem with gatherings if everybody is triple vaccinated uh, and ideally, uh, have had rapid tests before coming together for a couple few days, including the day of the gathering. That would be good, having good ventilation, whether that's windows open, HEPA filters, CO2 monitors, you know, pulling out of those stops. Yeah. But, um, you know, if you just have a reckless without the vaccines, without all the tools we know, there could be a, a, an issue that evolves. So your your final message to folks who are worried, Dr. Topol, uh, it's not inevitable in your view that we're going to get sick with this if we're triple vaxxed. There is there is hope. No, not at all. I mean, we don't want to just surrender to, yeah. to Omicron. It's premature to even think about that. There's too much unpredictable. We have too many tools and uh, we, we can avoid this virus and prevail over it if we get serious. Unfortunately, that hasn't been the case. And we were warned uh, you know, a few weeks ago and we still haven't geared up. All right. Well, hopefully uh, everyone hears what you're saying and goes and gets tested as soon as possible. Dr. Tobel, really appreciate you joining us. And thank you for all of the insights you've given us throughout the pandemic. I'm obviously a huge fan of your Twitter feed. So thank you so much. That was Dr. Eric Topol, founder and director of the Scripps Research Translational Institute. Thanks again.